Our next illustrious interviewee, Robert Poss from Band of Susans, is another man who knows all about the gulf that exists between good press and decent record sales. Hailing from the same cool New York City scene that gave us Sonic Youth, Dinosaur Jr. and Steve Albini, Band of Susans have for some years now been threatening to make a major breakthrough. This week, Robert Poss gave No Disco an exclusive version of their story so far. We have some rather perverse approaches to recording and production, and we sort of tend to do things that engineers tend to sort of wonder about um, in terms of having the guitar level very high and doing different things, processing the bass guitar and having the vocals maybe a bit lower than a lot of bands. Um, but I don't know, being in the studio is for me, and I'm the, the producer as well as, as you know, writing and playing and singing, it's really, to me, it's just, a, it's like, the most fun in the world. I mean, I love every minute of it. Um, it's very nerve-wracking, it's very tense, but the whole process is sort of so much fun because you're sort of constructing something from nothing. You're sort of like making a film, and you're starting with a, sort of a storyline, and you're all of a sudden seeing it realized into something that sort of lives on, it has a life of its own. Our instincts are inherently a bit off, a bit strange. Um, and I know this because when I go and work with a new engineer and then I, I go to the desk and the engineer might set up some sounds and I'll go start mixing and I'll sort of move everything around in some strange way and the engineer will come back and say, well, what have you done? And you know, basically I'll say, well, this is how we like it. Um, the most important thing on a certain level for us has been not to make the same record over and over again. A lot of bands, it seems to me, sort of make a record, stumble upon a sound, and then for the rest of their career, remake the same record. Every one of our records sounds a bit different, and um, we're, really, we're really pleased by that. That is intentional. Um, when we go into the studio to make a record, we don't have, we might have a vague idea about certain kind of sounds we want to use or certain kind of you know, guitar approaches, but um, it, like I said, it does take on a life of its own. It's never been a problem for us. Um, we don't seem to dis ever have a problem sort of falling into the more conventional stuff. Although there's a, always been a range. I mean, it's, it's a misconception, I think, that all our stuff is really difficult or really totally wild wall of guitars. Some of it, you know, is sort of pop. And there's a song um, on our, our new record, Veil, the song Blind, which we actually have a video for, that's a bit more on the pop side compared to some of our other stuff. And we like that. We don't, um, we sort of, the, the fun we have at Band of Susans is mixing the noise with the pop. I pointed out to some British journalists some early reviews of ours, some reviews written in 1988 that were referring to us as grunge, as in Band of Susan's wall of grunge, and that people got sort of a chuckle over that because in 1988 most people were not thinking about Nirvana or grunge or whatever. All these labels at a certain point become meaningless in the sense that grunge in the U.S. now is no longer a musical label. It's sort of like a marketing term. It's, 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 it's fashion and lifestyle and and it, it symbolizes um, it symbolizes something that has very little to do with music at this point. Since we have a certain track record in the UK press, since we've been releasing records there consistently since 87, most people sort of know our history. And they sort of know that we came out of the New York City group of bands like Live Skull and Sonic Youth and Swans and Honeymoon Killers. Some of these bands are better known than others. But that we sort of come from that somewhat experimental tradition. Um, and the way Sonic Youth, the way you would never would say about Sonic Youth, oh, they're just a pop band, <clears throat> or you would never say they're just a rock band. Similarly for us, you would never just say we're one or the other. We'd all love that guitar-shaped swimming pool and, 
and you know the, the fancy cars and everything else and that would be a lot of fun and I think that you know I have enough personal problems that I could be a very good sort of Elvis you know I could I could really I could really sort of sort of do justice to become to become a really terrible rock star given the right amount of money um, but ultimately our, our uh, I guess our goals are really musical we're, we work very hard we're very ambitious and, and you know, it's a mistake to think that we want to stay a cult band or we want to stay small we'd love to sell lots and lots of records and love to to you know make more videos and travel even do more touring um, there are just certain limits to the to what we would we would do in order to do that but we're, we're interested in expanding the band and also getting people familiar with our back catalog and stuff we've done and um, so you know we're not we don't hide from the press and we don't we don't um, we don't see that major labels are inherently evil or anything like that. It's, it's, nothing, it's nothing like that. The, the truth of the matter is that when we, even when we think we've made a compromise, like we, maybe we think we've put a level of vocals a little bit higher than we're really comfortable with, because maybe we think, well, you know, the vocals are really good in this song, and even though we like the sound of the vocals buried in the mix, maybe we should have them a little higher because it'll be better for radio. We'll go do that, and then we'll get the first review of the record, and what it will say, it will say, you can't hear the vocals. So we're not even, uh, we're not particularly uh, adept at compromising, I think, even if we uh, were to try to. For me, having listened to music since I was a really young kid and, and sort of been in love with rock and roll my whole life, I mean, it does seem to be that rock and roll, sort of white rock and roll, sort of on the American or English model or whatever, and, and Irish model as well, is, is sometimes verges on sort of a weird self-parody. And it, it, do, it does seem to be sort of that now people are so, e so eager to talk about their drug problems and their rehabilitation. and their troubles with the law, as if that this is, this is almost more important than sort of building a persona is, is more important than like some really cool music. And the sort of cliche, it's sort of sometimes hard to tell the difference between like Aerosmith and, Madonna, and, um, and Nirvana and Madonna, you know, despite the fact that that music is so different that there's that certain larger than life thing, that sort of cartoon characterization that I find a bit silly. You know, there's, there's all kinds of crossovers going on um, not in so much in what they call alternative uh, music. Um, America, you know, it's a really diverse, a really rich culture, and there's any number of sort of, you know, ethnic groups doing different kinds of music, and obviously rock and roll, white rock and roll, really came from sort of black, the black experience, rhythm and blues, and um, uh, the blues itself, but on the other hand, you can't see just someone like Elvis is simply just ripping off black music because, you know, Elvis, in a certain sense, and sort of all rock and roll, which sort of mythically grows from Elvis or whatever, there was also sort of country music, and there was sort of white hillbilly music, and rural white blues, um, and country, and folk, um, that, you know, there's also part of the tradition, too. Um, obviously, some of the, you know, the coolest and um, most innovative stuff is coming from black music and from dance music in general. And it's nice to see certain bands that are sort of bridging that gap. There's more of a compared to the U.S. There's more of a respect for indie labels, and because of the weekly British press, whatever its problems, 
um, in, in shortfalls, people are really pretty well informed and are more likely to actually seek out some more obscure things. America is really ruled, especially even the alternative, so-called alternative market, whatever you want to call it, um, is really ruled by MTV and a small number of videos and a small number of publications. And people these days, as compared with, let's say, five years ago, are much less willing to go out and check out a band that they haven't seen on MTV. I've been listening to music since around 1964. Um, when, before, I was so young that I thought that electric guitars were something you plugged into the wall. Although they were sort of like an appliance, like a blender or a, uh, a refrigerator. I thought, somehow I thought you plugged them into the wall, because I knew they were called electric guitars, and I thought you plug them into the wall and they would do something, kind of like an electric toothbrush. Um, and I've been sort of a music fan and a fan of guitars and obsessed with guitars ever, ever since then when I was just a kid. Um, and I guess when I was a teenager, I started, picked up a, a bass actually, it's my first instrument, started playing like everybody else in America and everywhere else, I suppose. Um, taught myself to play, started playing in bands and um, sort of haven't stopped since. Band of Susan's latest and fourth LP, Vein, is available on Rough Trade Germany and most of their back catalogue, meanwhile, can be found on the Blast First label.